Ah, good morning. Welcome back to the second part of this morning's uh, symposium. Uh, it's lovely to be here. My name's Julie. I'm a respiratory physical therapist here at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health. And um, we're going to sort of delve deeper into looking at breathlessness, breathlessness management, looking at uh, getting the diagnosis right, looking at how um, the psychology around breathlessness is obviously hugely important. And then I'll sort of finish off the morning looking at how we might be able to detect abnormal breathing patterns sort of in everyday life and watching your athletes breathe uh, and see see how we can help with uh, improving those breathing patterns. So uh, let's kick us off uh, with uh, Dr. Clem, who's going to look at the breathless athlete getting the diagnosis right. So brilliant place to start. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at this conference. My name is Hege Clem. And I'm a pediatric pulmonologist and a sports physician working in Bergen in Norway. I'm also the head of Bergen ELO group, a research group focusing on laryngeal obstruction. And today I'm going to talk about the breathless athlete and getting the diagnosis right. But first, I'd like to make a statement that respiratory illness in athletes needs more attention because a respiratory illness in athletes is actually involved in 50% of all acute illness in athletes. And all athletes can experience breathlessness. And ALO is a common respiratory illness in athletes. And if you don't know what ALO is, then you should keep on listening. Because it is not only endurance athletes that can have breathing problems. All kinds of athletes can experience that. And to illustrate how important it is to figure out the correct diagnosis, I would like you to meet Herman Thomasgård. He's an athlete. He was competing in the Olympic Games in Tokyo 2020, and he experienced severe breathing problems only 12 weeks before the Olympic Games. And in this film, he will tell you about his experience. Hey, my name is Herman and I competed in the Tokyo Olympics in the laser class, where I in the end ended up with a bronze medal. Uh, but on the way there, in the spring of 2021, I started experiencing a lot of breathing difficulties during a camp in uh, Lanzarote. Uh, in the beginning, it started out the first time it wasn't, uh, or it started being some uh, problems with the breathing, but I couldn't put exactly the thing, my, uh, put my finger on what was uh, the main problem. Uh, but then eventually it developed more and more and in the end I started uh, having to stop regattas during uh, the stop during a regatta and I couldn't finish them and it even got to the point where I was hyperventilating out on the water just trying to get uh, air in uh, and of course this caused a lot of frustration and it was uh, especially as it was the lead up to the Olympics it, it was something I was thinking about absolutely all the time and it was causing me and my coach a lot of stress uh, and we were yeah tr trying to figure out uh, how it was and at one point there i was so frustrated that i thought okay the result in this olympics is over no way it's gonna be a good result but at least i'm qualified i'll just go there and say that i've done our olympics uh, but then eventually i got some help we found out what the problem was and with the right techniques, the, it started getting better. And once it started getting better, it quite quickly got better and better. And just in time, actually for the last camp before the Olympics, I could feel that it was getting a lot better and that I was starting to get control on it. Of course, the, it still remained a, a little bit of a stress moment with how it, how it would be when putting a lot of stress on, uh, my, on the body and on the mind during our Olympics. Uh, but luckily during the Tokyo Olympics, I managed to keep control on it and ended up with a bronze medal. Yeah. Yes, as you heard, it was not easy to figure out why he was struggling with his breathing. So if an athlete is struggling to breathe in relation to exercise, and if this happens over and over again, he or she would most likely seek a doctor and often complain that it's difficult to breathe there during activity and tell that they can't really get enough air. 
And given no heart condition or other health issue, the most common thought is asthma. And the doctor may most often prescribe an inhaler to try out. And that's no wonder, because asthma is a common disease and WHO has stated that over 235 million in the world have asthma. So pay attention in a world full of asthma and infection. It's difficult, but it's important because not all exercise-induced breathing problems are caused by asthma or infection. In 2020, Dr. Hall and his colleagues published this paper where they reported on systematically screened athletes for respiratory symptoms. A total of 80% had respiratory symptoms of significance. Of those, 22% had dysfunctional breathing and 34% had laryngeal dysfunction. In this scenario, if you only considered asthma as a cause, you would risk neglecting 56% of other treatable causes. So you should always consider both upper and lower airways and do not forget the larynx, because the larynx is the entrance to the top of the lower airways. And here you can see a normal larynx with the air pipe, vocal folds on both sides, and the supraglottic structures or tubercle cuneiform, and also the epiglottic. And when you have inducible laryngeal obstruction, you often have a normal larynx at rest. But when something alters the ventilation, like exercise or other respiratory diseases, this result in most cases are, of course, a normal larynx. However, in many cases, laryngeal obstruction can be induced. And if the inducer is exercise, the name of the condition is exercise-induced laryngeal obstruction, ALO. So this film shows how a normal larynx looks like during exercise. And you can he here see the vocal folds and the supraglottic structures are standing wide open with little to no movement at all. The next films show how severe ALO looks like. The larynx appear normal in the beginning, and then you may notice some adduction in the supraglottic area that increases along with the intensity of exercise. And secondly, the vocal folds starts to adduct. And at maximum exercise, there are actually a total obstruction of both the vocal folds and the supraglottic structures. So this uh, athlete, she has really, really problem breathing. So this is really severe ALO. So how common is ALO in athletes? As I mentioned earlier, exercise-induced laryngeal obstruction is not a rare diagnosis. Because if you listen to this breathing sound, my experience is that nearly everybody have heard it. This is a published paper on ALO prevalence in athletes from Sweden. And in this population, 54% of the athletes had ALO and or asthma. And 27% had ALO. And 11 had both asthma and ALO. And that is something to be aware of. However, it is important to notice that not all with ALO had strider, as was case in this study, where only one in 24 cases had strider. Two other studies have looked at prevalence in an unselected youth population and found the prevalence of ALO to be five to seven and a half percent in otherwise healthy young people. So, symptoms of asthma or exercise-induced bronchoconstriction and ALO are often mixed up. So to illustrate the main difference between them, you can say that 
ALO is a difficulty in breathing in. An exercise induced bronchoconstriction or asthma is difficult breathing out. ALO, it peaks at peak exercise at maximum intensity and exercise induced bronchoconstriction after incre often increase after the exercise has stopped. An ALO, it most often ends one to five minutes after exercise if the person is able to calm down. But with exercise induced bronchoconstriction, it often peaks three to 15 minutes after exercise. So looking at this, it should be easy to separate. However, self-reported symptoms in athletes have low sensitivity and specificity for both ALO and asthma. So if you are not sure, test for it. And this is a suggested evaluation flowchart published by uh, British Journal of Sports Medicine by a subgroup of uh, IOC consensus on acute respiratory illness in athletes. And we start out with asking the patient about his or her symptoms. Is it during inspiration or during expiration, during or after exercise? And how long does the symptoms last? And sometimes it can also be very helpful to watch a video recording of an episode. So next step is the respiratory evaluation. When dealing with breathing problems, you should always do a spirometry with subutomol reversibility. And then you should consider a provocation test to check for asthma. And when the problem is during exercise, you should also consider do a, doing an exercise test. And the exercise test need to include the test leader's description of the symptoms, both during and after exercise. And it's also important to see if the patient recognizes the symptoms. So then you have to decide if the symptoms are most compatible with ALO, exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, or other diseases, and decide on a treatment. And then, if the respiratory problem is not solved or only partly solved, you should do a CLE test for ALO or a CPET test, cardiopulmonary exercise test, in addition. So what is a CLE test? A CLE test is a continuous laryngoscopy during exercise test. And it's done by inserting a flexible laryngoscope through the nose attach it to a headgear so you get a good overview of the larynx and then the patient exercise from rest to maximum exercise either on a treadmill or on a bicycle and this test is the gold standard for the uh, ALO examination and was first published in the laryngoscope in 2006 and this is our laboratory in Bergen where we have done ALO tests since 1997. I will here show you a film on how you can do a simple CLE test. The CLE test is the gold standard in diagnosing ALO. It provides a real-time evaluation of the larynx during exercise. Before you start with a CLE test, you give the patient local anesthetic gel or spray that numbs nasal cavity. A flexible laryngoscope with a diameter of 2.6 millimeters is inserted into the nostril to the back of the patient's throat. The laryngoscope is attached safely to the patient's headgear. This permits uninterrupted visualization of laryngeal movement during physical activity. Before the patient starts walking on a treadmill, the doctor explains what we are seeing on the monitor and how the larynx works. Then the patient is asked to run on a treadmill or to ride on a bike. Since ALO frequently appears at the patient's physical limit, the patient is asked to continue until symptoms occur. Symptoms of ALO often increase towards the end of the test. Right after the CLE test, the findings in the larynx are explained to the patient. Breeding advices are given and the best treatment option decided on.
Yes, but what do we look for during this test? We grade the obstruction in the larynx from zero to three and on two levels, on the glottic level and on the superglottic level. And this is to also decide on the treatment because the glottic obstruction can only be treated conservative. However, the superglottic uh, obstruction can sometimes be treated conservative, but sometimes also needs surgery. And you may have different combinations of the glottic and superglottic obstructions. And the most common combination is superglottic obstruction as the major component and the glottic obstruction as a secondary phenomenon, like you see in this movie. However, you may also have only superglottic obstruction, like you can see in this patient, starting out normal and with uh, maximum intensity, you can see that it's superglottic obstruction, but the vocal folds is standing wide open. And then you also can have only glottic obstruction, which also can be called VCD, vocal cord dysfunction. But and this is actually really rare, and we only see it in three to six percent of ALO patients. So if you go back to the athlete from the beginning, 12 weeks before his competition, he had severe acute breathing problems and did a lot of tests. He had mild asthma, but no effect of asthma medication. He had some gastroesophageal reflux symptoms but no effect of treatment. And he even did a CT scan, which was also normal. So four weeks before the Olympic game, he finally did a CLE test and could conclude that his problem was ALO. Hey, I'm Herman. I uh, competed in the to Tokyo Olympics uh, in sailing. Uh, in the lead up to the Olympics in the spring of 2021, I started struggling with some breathing problems during a training camp in Lanzarote. In the beginning, I, I was, it was hard for me to figure out, ex to pinpoint exactly what part of the breathing I was struggling with. And it was only while sailing I was uh, struggling. I've always tested a little bit positive for, uh, uh, for asthma, when you look at my breathing uh, curve. Uh, and I got, they tried me on some asthma medication, uh, which did not to help it did not uh, help at all with my breathing uh, and uh, and uh, the breathing just got worse and worse then my, I was struggling more with pulling air in than out and that it could be ILO but uh, I was only struggling while sailing which of course was a little bit uh, strange when I started getting a diagnosis for ILO and getting some techniques uh, and it started uh, improving. It actually started improving quite rapidly. And just in time for the last camp before the, uh, for the Tokyo Olympics, I felt I was starting to get control on it. And I was starting, it was starting to feel feeling better and better. But in the end, I, I managed to keep control on it during the whole games and ended up with a bronze medal. Yes, so this shows how important it is to get correct diagnosis uh, of these breathing problems. But how did we actually treat him in four weeks? I didn't know anything about his sport, so it was actually crucial for me to go through every step of his competition mode to figure out where I could, could help him. So after a standard CLE test, we tried actually to mimic his position during sailing. And we realized that when he tried to help himself breathing better, he actually made his breathing problem worse by closing the larynx. And the guiding, guided feedback in this position was actually important for the success. So to sum up, why is it important to be aware of ALO? Yes, it's important uh, because it's quite common and it has a high impact on exercise performance and quality of life. It's often confused with asthma and it can also complicate interpretation of asthma symptoms. 
And also the patient could get adverse effect of asthma medication. And it can prevent young people in general from taking part in physical activity. It can complicate and even ruin sports careers and it's treatable, so it shouldn't be overlooked. So be aware of ALO in athletes and you may suspect ALO by symptoms, but only a CLE test can actually confirm an ALO diagnose. And a CLE test in addition would guide the treatment and give the athlete a better understanding of the problem and also give the athlete direct feedback on breathing instructions. So if you would like to read more about ALO, you can read this recently published uh, uh, article from a subgroup of the IOC consensus on acute respiratory illness in athletes published in British Journal of Sports Medicine. And if you, if you want to go even further into ALO, I would welcome you to the ILO conference in Bergen in June this year. And if you don't are able to come to Bergen, you can join virtual. So I would like to thank all of my colleagues and collaborators, and I will also thank you for the opportunity to speak at this conference. Thanks. Ah, that was a lovely presentation there by Dr. Clem, really looking at, at the differences and the different differential diagnosis. Uh, super clear, so thank you for that. Uh, interesting to see with that uh, the success of the athlete looked fab. Uh, but the, um, you know, the thought that he was trying to help himself to get his breathing right uh, was possibly contributing to the problem potentially. Was leads us nicely onto the next presentation by Professor Olin. Is going to look at the psychology around breathing, and you know what do we know and how we can help it because it's just an important factor that we have to build in um, when we're helping athletes to uh, get their breathing right. My name's Todd Olin. I'm a respiratory doctor at a respiratory hospital in the United States named National Jewish Health. Uh, I wanted to thank Dr. Hull and the program committee for inviting me to speak today to you. Uh, I was going to talk about the theme of psychology as it relates to respiratory disease. And the title of this talk is The Psychology of Athletic Breathing, What We Know and How We Can Help. There have been some high profile cases in the recent past that have highlighted the need for healthcare providers to both appreciate and effectively intervene when mental health concerns are potentially on the table. And in addition to the high profile cases, there's been a lot of work behind the scene in the past decade aimed to optimize uh, the the, the mental health care of patients with a variety of con conditions or with no conditions that just need screening. What we know uh, as it relates to general disease, and then we'll get into respiratory disease shortly, is that uh, there, there are a lot of, there, there's a very high prevalence of problems, whether it's anxiety spectrum diseases, depression spectrum diseases, suicide risk, or other conditions. We know that the prevalence among athlete groups can be quite high. And then we also know that there's different tools out there that can be used to improve the care of these athletes, whether it's to triage them, to screen for different conditions, or ultimately to link them into definitive care. About five years ago, the IOC got together a group of athletes as one of its consensus projects and came up with both a triaging tool and screening tool for different conditions. That's the sport mental health assessment tool. And this is now widely used in a variety of different countries around the globe. Um, and readily, it, it's simple to implement. Um, what we're finding with that is that, you know, as part of the process, and it, the more and more athletes contribute to this, is that depression spectrum conditions, anxiety spectrum conditions, and other conditions are quite prominent. Um, as part of the process, athletes were surveyed about what they associated most with in terms of the interface between elite sport performance and mental health. And as you can see through um, this emphasis plot, 
that um, th there, the depression spectrum conditions and anxiety spectrum conditions are widely represented, but there, there are also um, a lot of words that come out that, that highlight the stigma that goes along with mental health uh, considerations among athletes. The, the triaging tool that is advocated within this sport mental health assessment tool is called the Athlete Psychological Strain Questionnaire. And this was developed by a group of performance psychologists. And, and what they, they ultimately did in breaking down a lot of the different uh, sources of strain for athletes, they recognized that there were different domains of um, strain that affected people, whether it was self-regulation or uh, the ability to, of an athlete to uh, interface with different situations, the performance itself and the different specific stresses of performance or um, you know, the stresses of injury, and then coping strategies um, played into this you know, as it relates to um, adaptive and maladaptive uh, ways that athletes cope with different stresses. Um, different performance psychologists outside of this project have in very elaborate ways broken down the different stresses that athletes go through. And not that I want you to screenshot this and memorize everything in here, but I, what I want to highlight here is that um, of all of the different stresses that are thought to affect athletes, whether it's the stresses of um, the leadership and the personnel within different teams or the cultural issues that different teams bring to the table or logistical and environmental issues that are present. There, there's a small group of the stresses that relate to the different performance and personal issues that athletes go through. And only one of these relates to injury. As you'll see, illness doesn't really factor into this or, or respiratory disease. But for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna think about uh, different respiratory conditions, specifically asthma and exercise-induced laryngeal obstruction, as falling into this injury category in terms of modeling how different people might adapt to the different stresses out there. Things that we know about the interface between exercise, respiratory disease, and psychology, as it relates specifically to ILO and asthma, are out there in the literature. And so there are a few things that I'd want uh, viewers of this presentation to take home. The first thing is, as it relates to asthma in a more general population, we know that it turns out that asthma is actually a relatively strong deterrent to exercise. So in a general population, what you might run into as a provider and what might shade the information that you gather historically from different patients is the fact that consciously or unconsciously um, adolescents are actually deterred from exercising simply because they have asthma. Now, this, this can be an external thing as well in that parents and coaches have been documented in other research to actually be less likely to put adolescents in situations where they would be expected to trigger their asthma, specifically exercise. And that, again, might shade the information that a healthcare provider uh, might obtain in the course of a clinical visit. Another domain at that interface between respiratory disease psychology and exercise relates to elite athletes and the process through which athletes are uh, granted permission to, uh, to use different medications, a process called the therapeutic use exemption process. In an interesting study performed in Denmark about nine years ago, what were uh, several hundred athletes were surveyed about their perceptions of the therapeutic use exemption process. What was, what was uncovered is there were a lot of different domains in which people had concerns, whether there were administrative obstacles, um, you know, or, or different questions that were thought to be too personal. What, what was determined in this study was that athletes felt like there was a lot of potential for misuse of the process. And frankly, there were perceptions that certain individuals were cheating. And it turned out that the, the people that were the least trusting of the therapeutic use exemption process were those who had successfully acquired therapeutic use exemptions uh, through, through their healthcare providers. Again, the take home message being here that at that interface between respiratory disease psychology 
and athletics, there might be information that could be biased um, that one would acquire as a healthcare provider. Spinning this in terms of what we know and, and how this interface, again, might affect exercise-induced laryngeal obstruction, um, th there's a lot of potential for bias. And so the very first paper about uh, what was at that time called vocal cord dysfunction, the first modern paper in 1983 by Dr. Christopher, talked about those who had the irritant-associated version of this condition. And the, the case series of patients very much painted a picture of severe psychopathology overlapping with respiratory disease. And in the first seminal paper as it related to exercise, um, a paper by Dr. McFadden in the 90s entitled Vocal Cord Dysfunction Masquerading, Masquerading as Exercise-Induced Asthma, D Dr. McFadden painted a picture in this case series of this, this interesting observation, anecdotal as it was, uh, between behavioral health concerns and respiratory disease. And he painted this picture of those with anxiety spectrum conditions um, and perfectionism as maybe playing into um, some of the pathology that providers were seeing. What this paper did also is now in retrospect is it might have um, consciously or unconsciously caused a link between be behavioral health concerns and the physiologic phenomenon of ILO defined as glottic or superglottic obstruction that's reversible and highly linked with high intensity exercise. Um, perfectionism, for those of you that don't understand the concept completely, um, as described by a pulmonologist and not a psychologist, it is a series of traits that can be broken down into three contributing traits, one of orderliness and one of high self standards, both being highly adaptive, you know, often uh, displayed by many of the leaders of society. There's a third domain that, that plays into perfectionism, and it's the trait of discrepancy, which is what this is. It's the ability for a person and often the negative response of a person to the ability to discern the difference between where one wants to be maybe the goal or what they perceive they should be and where they perceive that they're at. That, that ability to detect that difference and negatively respond to it frequently, again, being known as discrepancy, this was tied into this first paper. Now, interestingly, and much more recently, Dr. Clem's group in, in Bergen looked at the interface between behavioral health traits and ILO in a very organized way. And what they did is they took um, validated standardized assessments of general health and behavioral health administered to a general population and then cross-referenced that with known diagnostic information from those who had obtained continuous laryngoscopy during exercise in a diagnosis of, of, of ILO, excuse me. And what they found was there was really no demonstrable link between anxiety spectrum problems and a diagnosis of of, of ILO in this Norwegian population. And so what this paper did, where like, I don't think we can say that it got at things that a resolution defined enough to really break down such micro traits as perfectionism, but what it did do is it really called into question the conscious or unconscious link that many healthcare providers, um, and you know, admittedly, especially those in the United States, uh, between behavioral health concerns and a diagnosis of ILO. And so to summarize quickly what we know about, again, this interface between respiratory concerns, psychologic behavioral health concerns, and athletics or exercise is that psychology and psychologic health are clearly important. And we might be able to think about respiratory disease as it relates to this model best in an injury-like injury state um, it turns out that asthma and ILO present unique challenges when we're using models like this, um, but there are going to be unique considerations. How can we help as healthcare providers? I think there's a number of different ways. As I just mentioned with the, the work coming out of Dr. Clem's group, I think that we, we all need to question the different biases at, 
that come to the table in any healthcare setting. Those might be biases that come to the table from the patient in terms of things that they're expecting or stigma that they've sort of encountered in the past. It might be biases that come to the table at the level of the healthcare provider. I think that as we become introspective and cognizant of these things, they, at least when they're out on the table, they're less likely to um, influence in ways that we're not aware. And so in, in the words of Ice Cube, in order to bring some levity to Dr. Hull's presentation here, we, we want everyone to check themselves before they wreck themselves, to be aware of what you bring to the table at the very least, then maybe think of what the patient is bringing to the table above and beyond the, the strict verbatim um, descriptions you know, to the answers to one's questions. The second thing I think we can do in thinking through that interface between behavioral health, respiratory disease, and sport is to really set expectations uh, with the goal of optimizing a treatment relationship. If we think of injury recovery, or in this case, respiratory recovery in response to different treatments, not all of the treatments have magic overnight success especially the respiratory retraining interventions that we use for ILO, they're, they're incremental, they take some time, there are different setbacks that occur along the way, different challenges are met at different times, and setting this expectation up front, I think optimizes that provider-patient relationship or provider-athlete relationship. It's, it's a little bit different than optimizing all of the physiologic interventions that we do, but sort of using that behavioral health domain to improve the relationship. A second thing that we can do therapeutically is use behavioral health concerns as one of many lenses through which we look to optimize the implementation of different treatments. As an example, when we're implementing different respiratory retraining strategies for athletes that have ILO, in addition to the pure biomechanics of what we're trying to get different athletes to do, we need to think of different domains to condition the different behaviors so that they can be performed without much co um, conscious thought to factor in the different tactics of different sports and implement the techniques differently, simply thinking of the sport. But these bottom two domains, taking into consideration the psychology of the athlete, how they're going to best be able to learn or best be able to you know, respond to challenging situations and thinking about the social interactions that might occur, the stigma that, um, that different coaches might have also be unconsciously bringing to the table with respect to respiratory disease or the different things that parents um, or teammates or you know, trainers are bringing to the table to, to take into consideration the individual and group level behavioral health uh, considerations uh, within an athlete's environment, within the sporting domain. Um, by doing that, we can optimize the effectiveness of different treatments. So again, in terms of how we can help to kind of wrap, put, put a bottle around this uh, to an extent, the first thing is I would say, I, I think the most important thing is to recognize that having a relationship at the provider athlete level is important. And the optimal outcomes likely come from a relationship that's developed over time and maintained over time. I think it's important to be really cognizant of different diagnostic biases that might occur because patients have uh, bring things to the table related to stigma around different respiratory diseases or expectations around that which needs to be said to acquire different medications. Um, we can maybe assess different individual or group level issues that might affect therapeutic implementation where, where different patients might have different learning strategies as it relates to uh, different respiratory retraining strategies or, or different concerns around the use of asthma therapeutics. And probably most importantly, we think it's very, very important that Above and beyond respiratory disease, if you think that somebody, a patient in front of you, an athlete, has behavioral health concerns that might need assistance above and beyond what a respiratory provider can provide, 
a sport medicine provider or a cardiologist can provide, it's important to just call that out and, and get that extra level of help for those of you um, that you, for those patients that you think need further assistance. Um, and so again, to sort of summarize what we can bring to the table by at least appreciating that th there is this interaction between behavioral health, respiratory disease, and exercise, we can both um, bring things to the table in, in terms of optimizing our diagnostic utility and therapeutic interventions. I want to thank you for your time. Um, hopefully next year we can do this in person and have more of an interactive scenario. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions, and um, I thank you very much. Uh, it's a lovely presentation there by Professor Olin. Olin. Really important to look at the individual nature of our therapy for our athletes and really uh, raising the profile of the psychological health. So I want to um, lead us into the last presentation of the morning, which is by myself looking at seeing, uh, I, as a physical therapist myself, how I might detect and, and monitor breathing patterns. Uh, start getting your questions coming in, uh, please do, so we can then finish the morning with a good discussion. So. Let's crack on with the last session. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the final session of the day. My name's Julie. I'm a respiratory physiotherapist here at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health, and I help athletes with their breathing patterns. And I'm going to talk to you today about detecting and monitoring abnormal breathing patterns in athletes. So let's get started. OK, so I think we should start off just by getting the terminology right, because uh, it's a little bit mixed in the literature. You'll see terms like breathing pattern disorder, BPD, uh, but it's also known as dysfunctional breathing too. And a definition um, of a breathing pattern disorder or dysfunctional breathing is, as it says there from Physiopedia, defined as a chronic or recurrent changing breathing pattern. OK, and it cannot be attributed to a specific medical problem but it does cause potentially respiratory problems, complaint symptoms, and also non-respiratory complaints, which is quite important, isn't it, for us to remember. It's not a disease process, but rather alterations in breathing patterns that interferes with the normal respiratory processes, which you can imagine is essential for the athlete and their performance. So what I'd like to go through today is these three stages. Um, you know, we've got to just look at uh, briefly, which because I know we've talked about it this morning already, but making sure that the diagnosis is right, absolutely essential. Also then, you know, looking at what, what tools do we have to assess and how would we manage a breathing pattern? And it's important for us to recognise both at rest and during exercise. And then uh, touch on sensory management and looking out for triggers for sort of the long term monitoring of a breathing pattern problem. So, yeah, so this lovely uh, document that's just been uh, released in the last month or so by Dr. Hall and uh, an amazing team that's pulled this BTS clinical statement um, uh, really helps us to appreciate the, the breadth of respiratory problems that athletes experience. Uh, but what we've got to remember from a breathing pattern problem is that they can not only contribute uh, to these underlying problems, but it can mimic it. So the athlete will, ex will uh, tell you very similar symptoms so it can get confusing for the athlete as to know what what's exactly wrong so getting that confidence and getting that diagnosis right is really essential for them to be able to change and correct their breathing pattern not question it too much so this lovely study looked at about 150 athletes and what they found was is that you know almost half of them had respiratory issues uh, and then half again had, you know, a, an underlying organic reason uh, for that respiratory issue. But as you can see there, that quite a lot of them didn't. And you are kind of question, was that a breathing pattern disorder? And I'd like to see in future research that we start to see an extra hoop there where the breathing pattern disorder is diagnosed. So. As I said, the elimination is absolutely essential. And here at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health, the athlete will go through a range of tests so we can really get the diagnosis right. But often at the end of that, uh, the result is, is that the, actually the symptoms are due to a breathing pattern problem and that's when they'll come and see me. So 
how would we detect and monitor a breathing pattern problem? Well, during that process of elimination, the chance of they've had a cardiopulmonary exercise test. What we're finding, obviously, we can get a lot of information from that, including obviously tidal volumes, breathing rate. And so we can get a real good idea whether the, the athlete is breathing um, from a visual point of view, looking at their pattern, but also what's happening um, with those respiratory parameters, which tells us a lot. But I think moving to the future that we're going to see more of this, we're going to see more of plasmography. Uh, so looking at the pattern of movement, looking to see what's moving, what muscles are contributing to that breathing pattern and seeing if it's going to the right place. That's essentially, you know, the issue with a breathing pattern problem. If we remind ourselves of what muscles should be used, well, we know the diaphragm is the predominant breathing muscle, um, but often it doesn't work through its full range of movement. Maybe it's restricted by the rib cage, but also you've got this whole range of accessory muscles that contribute both to the inspiration and the expiration during exercise that all have to work together as a team synergistically, and that doesn't happen all the time. So it's important for us to, to look at that and observe those muscles working. So we know that the diaphragm should be doing the predominantly amount of movement and it's pulling air into the bottom of the lungs. And if we just remind ourselves of the ventilation perfusion match that we're looking for, I'm trying to just remember that the bottom of the lungs is where kind of where it all happens. You know, that's where you get more blood, there's more perfusion, and that's the point of breathing, right? Get the oxygen to the blood, carbon dioxide out. But there's more room for breathing at the bottom too. So there's increased ventilation, because what we often see is this, this push of the breathing into the top part of the lungs where the ventilation in the rib cage is gonna limit the volume. It's not gonna be able to expand it and the lungs don't like it. So if we were to look at a cardiopulmonary exercise test and see what ideally what we'd be looking for, well, initially we're always looking at breathing at rest and um, you know making sure that the athlete breathes well at rest is, is, a, is a building block, it's a starting point. But then watching, seeing what happens as they exercise. And what you'll see from this lovely paper um, uh, that was published um, a year or so ago is uh, if you look at the plotting, you've got breathing frequency on the left there and you've got volumes on the right. Now, what should happen if you see the brown dots, that's the volumes, the, the volume of the, the, the lungs getting larger. OK, uh, that's what rises initially. You can see that start, start very sharp increase, can't you? And then the breathing rate might be sitting at about 20, 30 breaths per minute. And then it's not until those volumes reach their max that then the breathing rate, you see the breathing rate, the orange dots rises. That's the ideal pattern. That's what we're sort of looking for, the optimum. What we often see in breathing pattern problems is this uh, anarchy of movement, the dysfunction behind it, the muscles not, not working well together. So the volumes are changing, the breathing rate rises too quickly and it's really erratic. And as you can see, just by visually looking at that, uh, they're not all as bad as that, but that's a really good visual of, you know, how, how potentially it can look and, um, you know, a real mess, isn't it? So you can imagine the larynx gets a hit uh, you know, the lungs do not like this this way of breathing. Uh, the, you know, the gastric, the, the air's not getting to the right place, so you're not getting the optimal breathing pattern. The respiratory muscles potentially will start to fatigue, which is going to cause some blood stealing from those lower limbs. And then, you know, the performance will, will drop. And this is, as I say, it's not always the breathing that the athlete may be complaining of. It may be that their training sessions, you know, they're not able to perform, um, you know, and they're getting further into their, their programs or their, their training session that they're fatiguing too early something else to look, look out for. So the sort of symptoms um, that athletes will describe, well, that's another way of detecting uh, breathing pattern problems. So let me just give you a bit of an idea. So this is an Omega one that's been used for years and years and years around hyperventilation, not necessarily sensitive to athletes and breathing patterns, but something's a starting point if you think someone is struggling with some of the symptoms there. The dyspnea, two, uh, dyspnea 12 sorry, is a nice uh, platform for breathing at rest because it takes on board the emotional sides of breathing, which is an important factor for us to look into when we're thinking about whether someone's breathing badly or not. 
You then have the self-evaluation breathing questionnaire, which has got about 25 questions on how to assess your breathing. So if you want to delve deeper, get a real good idea of how, how the athlete's breathing, that's another nice outcome measure that you can use. But more recently, uh, really delighted to see the ILO DI score uh, because this is more about breathing during exercise. And I know that it was designed to detect exercise induced low England obstruction, but I can't help feeling that as the as research progresses, we'll probably be using this tool, hopefully, uh, to recognise athletes that are breathing badly. Uh, so, yeah, so watch this space. They. Um, it's important to remember that these questionnaires in their own right, you know, are, are, don't mean anything. You've got to put it alongside the objective, you know, measurement of breathing patterns too. And, you know, the BPAT tool, if you're not familiar with this, this is a, a tool that's used to look at breathing at rest. So, you know, spend a minute and just looking at the breathing pattern. So I must clarify, it's not on exercise, but again, it's the starting point for you detecting an abnormal breathing pattern. So you might find that they're breathing in the top part of their chest, or it might be a combination of top and bottom, indicating what muscles are potentially being used. Um, we can hear, you might find that you can hear the athlete breathing in or out. Remember, this is just at rest. They might be combining their nose, their mouth, you know, all sorts can happen. Ideally, what you're looking for is that they're breathing in their tummy, it's silent, they're breathing through their nose. It's a nice rhythmical rate. So that's another tool that you can use. But really, we kind of want to look at what happens when the athlete is exercising. So uh, probably a better way um, initially is to just look at what happens when they take a big deep breath in. So, you know, you could potentially put a tape measure around the bottom of the rib cage at a, um, you know, at a certain level. Make sure you repeat it at the same level and you're looking for that expansion. If I just show you this video here, what you'll be able to see here in this athlete is, you know, when they're taking a big deep breath, what is happening? Now, can you see there, this is an abnormal deep breath. This is someone using their shoulders to drive the breathing and pull the ventilation to the top. You can see the accessory muscles working too hard at the, at the beginning there. So that's another nice way if you're looking at your athlete's breathing is just stand, get them to take a big deep breath and, and see what moves. You can also uh, get the athlete to do a little video um, or you can video them possibly to have a little watch, see what's happening, but listen. So have a little listen to this one. So what you'll have heard there is an inspiratory gasp and, you'll, and she's reaching for her throat too. Uh, possible signs of early stages of lingual obstruction there. Um, but you'll also, you know, that, that upper chest gasp, that tension around the upper chest is uh, an important thing to listen out for. You can also have a look at an athlete, obviously, while they're exercising. And let me just show you this video, because often while they're moving, it is good to look at them, but sometimes it's good to look at them after they've they've stopped. So let's have a look at this athlete here and you can just see, see if you can have a little look. So can you see how this is not a great breathing pattern? You can see how the athlete's shoulders are driving the breathing up. That upper chest breathing pattern is working too hard. There's asymmetry there, right side's working harder than the left or moving more than the left, shoulders are moving way too much. So again, another nice way of visually looking to see what is working. You might find you can look from the front too, you know, just seeing what's going on at the front here. Let's have a little look and see what's going on as we, as you do it, you could do a harder interval, get them to stop and then ha really um, have a look at what's going on. Now, can you see there, fast rate, upper chest breathing, not an optimal breathing pattern, working way too hard there in the top part of the chest. That's something that is just going to help you understand how are they breathing. So how are we going to fix this? Well, we've got to educate and re-establish normal moving patterns. So you're going to have to um, really work on getting them uh, breathing well at rest first. And so there might be some biomechanical issues that need to be dealt with. So um, this young athlete here, you can see that her uh, infrasternal angle is quite tight, which might be restricting the rib cage movement. She's also got some quite flared ribs. So it may be that the starting position of the diaphragm isn't optimal. So we'd work on that to try and improve that. But also look at head posture, um, you know, spinal alignment. You know, everything's got to be um, on top of each other, hasn't it? You know, the, the neck on top of the shoulders, 
and the diaphragm's on top of the pelvic floor, the pelvic region. And it, for the pelvic and the um, diaphragm to work nicely, they've got to be on top of each other. If they're at an angle, it's not going to work. So looking at the pelvic position, uh, really important for getting that optimum movement of the diaphragm. So initially, it may be that it's about educating, having an awareness of what should move, you know, how the diaphragm works, what happens at normal, normal breathing. And then you can use different ways of trying to inhibit the upper chest muscles to try and promote that lovely um, full range of movement of the diaphragm in a really easy position like lying down but also adopting different positions to encourage different parts of the rib cage to move. You know, the bottom of the rib cage moves, you know, forward, sideways and backwards. And it's really important that, you know, the thoracic spine and the back of the rib cage is being is nice and, and, and mobile so that the lungs can expand at the back there. But also then you want to kind of see if you can load that up a little bit and there'll be a progression depending on the, the sport that the athlete performs, whether it's the runners, you know, being able to just do it on one leg, whether it's a, a, a throwing athlete that needs to have one arm above their head or the swimmers, swimming positions. You know, you can imagine just changing the body position to check that the diaphragm can still work through its full range of movement when it's being loaded up. Using the TheraBand can sometimes quite nice to give the athlete some feedback as to where, where you want them to breathe. And then the progression would be to make it a little bit harder. Now, obviously you could do that with exercise, but you can do it in other ways. Inspiratory muscle training is a lovely tool to be able to use to help someone re-educate their breathing pattern, as long as you don't load it up too much, too soon, and then start to create a poor pattern. So really important to look at the pattern of breathing with the inspiratory muscle trainers. You can use balloons to help with external, um, you know, the external oblique muscles in terms of that active expression that we need with uh, breathing on exertion. Other nice ways in different positions. So some, some neat sort of exercises that we can do with the athletes. But then obviously you do want to be looking at them, you know, at lower intensity exercise, perhaps initially. So they've got a little bit more control over the breathing. I talk about uh, this 80-20 rule, you know, 20% movement at the top of the lungs and 80% at the bottom of the lungs. And, you know, often teaching the athletes that the breathing needs to, you know, the, the try and make it more effortless, especially the in part of the breath. If you're going to put any effort into anything, put it into the to the breathing out, making sure that the lungs deflate, diaphragm comes back up into its starting position so then it can kick off on the next breath in. And if I just show you a video here, hopefully you'll see an improvement in this athlete's breathing where she's then just, you know, doing an interval and then just thinking about her pattern, getting a better pattern, um, you know, using that purslip breathing can sometimes help to control the out breath, making it a little bit longer so the diaphragm rises up. And you can see that there's less movement of the upper chest there now. So looking, looking better with some concentration. And you can obviously work on that at high intensity exercise as you progress through the programme. But that's biomechanics. Uh, I think that it's absolutely essential that we also don't forget about the sensory side of breathing, because we know that when people are stressed or frightened or anxious, this will wind up the breathing, won't it? It will wind up the, the sympathetic nervous system. And we know that this increases the sensation of breathing and the tolerance to breathlessness reduces. Um, so it could be a potential part of the and uh, the reason why the athlete is experiencing this disproportionate breathlessness at high intensity exercise. So how what, might we measure this and detect this? Well, at rest, you could look at the athlete's breathing rate um, and, you know, you know, a normal breathing rate would be between 12 and, you know, average 12 breaths per minute if you're sitting not doing very much at all. So if they're sitting at 20 breaths per minute just as they're sat still, then, you know, the chances are that's that's uh, wound up a little bit and that's something you can work on pulling it back down. You can also potentially use something, um, a breath hold. Now, you know, the research and literature, uh, you know, is, is not um, uh, robust with this as such, but it's a nice tool I find as a therapist to use. It tells me a lot about what's potentially going on in terms of the drive to breathe. OK, so um, I would always do an expiratory breath hold because that's kind of a normal place where we would normally pause within our breathing. Our normal breathing pattern would be a breath in, a breath out and there's a slight pause before the next breath goes it uh, comes in so just getting getting the person just in sitting let's take a normal size breath in normal size breath out 
and then just hold it in there. So you could measure a few things. You could measure the first signs that they feel um, that they want to breathe, okay? And then what I like to do is get an idea of what's that sensation. So I'll ask them on a scale of zero to 10, zero not being any sensation of desire to breathe and 10 being maximal. Get a, get a, get a number on that, because that's going to give you some a little bit more of a, a benchmark as to what's going on. So it may be they might breath hold for like five seconds and they're an eight hour, nine out of 10, that's going to tell you that there's quite a strong drive to breathe. Ideally, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what's a normal? Uh, uh, you know, anywhere between 20, 30 seconds would, would be a, a kind of normal place that you could sort of sit fairly comfortably without breathing. So you might even go straight in and do a 20 second breath hold if you want to make it more objective. And the measurement is what's the sensation of breathing. What we're measuring? Well, there's lots of things that contribute to, to your breathing. So there's lots of things going on there. But another way, if you want to check in on the sensory side to breathing, that may need to be tackled, even in athletes. And the reason why that's important is because, you know, part of this, it's all very well recognising the breathing pattern, fixing the breathing pattern, but we need to monitor, we need for that breathing pattern to be sustainable. And there is a ton of things out there that's going to wind it up. And so this is probably just the tip of the iceberg, but can you see the sorts of things that basically can cause you to have a breathing pattern problem? So, you know, the athlete needs to really take a look at their world. They really need to know what are their triggers? It's very individual. So, you know, keeping a diary and talking it through with athletes, making sure they really understand what might be winding their breathing up. As you can see, there, there is a lot. So it, it could be anything from the way they're feeling in terms of their psychological state, or it might be some physiological things going on in terms of menstrual cycle and female athletes and things that may be contributing. So definite things that we can look at to help sustain a good breathing pattern and making sure that if the trigger comes in, we can't necessarily stop that potentially, but we can look at how the body reacts to it and make sure that they can control it and, and bring their breathing pattern back down to its optimal place. And, not, you know, so it's not not aggravating and becoming a habitually bad breathing pattern, which is what we see a lot. So to summarise, I'm always really keen to look at how do we prevent breathing pattern disorders in athletes. And so, you know, I'm an advocate, um, you know, committee member of the Physio for Breathing Pattern Disorders that has a website with some lovely videos, just breathing at rest. It's a great start starting point for you to understand and, and educate yourself and your athletes on how to breathe well, even just at rest is a, is a great starting point. But then looking at what happens when the exercise as we've gone through, and remember then looking at our triggers. And as I said before, uh, you know, even, I mean, I put that one there, that's a big one that I work on, uh, you know, really quite early on in the athletes rehabilitation program, getting the sleep right, absolutely essential to get your sleep right so you can recover well. One of the big problems with sleep is that often they can breathe with their mouth open and it's not gonna help your sleep pattern, it's not gonna help your lungs, it's not gonna help your recovery. So it's gonna be a first thing that I work on. So if you're thinking, oh, I'd love some uh, more advice on this or some help with your athletes, then, you know, do get in touch um, and hopefully we'll be able to um, help you with that and, and provide a platform of education or anything that you need to help your athletes get the best out of their breathing so that they get the best out of their performance. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. OK, so we've got lots of questions coming in. We've got we've got about 15 minutes. So I want to crack on and uh, get the question and answer panel started. Uh, first of all, can I just go to you, Dr. Clem, looking at the advantage? Is there any benefit for athletes using an anticholinergic inhaler before they exercise? Yeah, we, we have looked into that, actually, and uh, it, uh, we couldn't find any um significant benefits for ALO. Uh, no. um, but uh, what, what we actually realized in that study is that often it can be sports induced asthma that is undetected. And, mm -hmm. uh, and even if they have gone through some uh, uh, reversibility tests with a uh, subbutamol and it came out uh, negative and suddenly we realized that it was positive with the uh, Atrat. Or, no. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so so those who had effect from uh, from that medication, they actually had 
asthma. Uh, but for the ALO, it isn't had, it didn't have any effect. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? The the potential dual or even triple pathology that could be going on, uh, and it's not until you sort of unravel one that then you might detect the next one. Uh, and that's uh, some of the questions are coming in are looking at that. You know, do do we often see with all patients that have ILO, do they all have a dysfunctional breathing pattern? You got any thoughts on that, Hege? Yeah, it's a very good question, and and we wonder about that uh, because. But I, I think it's like uh, many people have both dysfunctional breathing and ALO, uh, but some ha only dysfunctional breathing without ALO and ALO without dysfunctional breathing. So I, I think it, you can have all kinds of uh, uh, mix. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think I'm probably slightly biased because all the ones that come to me have a breathing pattern problem. And uh, yeah. OK, um, so I know that, uh, Todd, people are really keen for you to demonstrate your ILO, ILOB uh, breathing exercises. And I wonder whether you would uh, be able to talk through for those people that are not aware of them, perhaps a demonstration. Sure. Yeah, and just to sort of describe it really quick, what the idea is that um, you're you're doing something biomechanically to open the glottis at a time where you want to open the glottis. The disclaimer on it was that we sort of discovered it by mistake. The the other disclaimer is it's a skill acquisition thing, so it takes a while to learn. So while everyone wants like the one minute version, or you know what can you show me in ten minutes, it doesn't really work that way. It's like learning to swim butterfly off of a video or something like that. It's, it's just not how skill acquisition happens. The, the crux behind it is that you're uh, introducing artificial resistance as you inhale before quickly um, eliminating that. And the when you, there's a really um, sort of appropriate balance of tension and relaxation timed appropriately, we can, with the laryngoscopes, watch the glottis open. Um, and our experience is it takes about three or four days to teach people, sort of as all the disclaimers. OK, so then now to actually show you how to do it, um, what we're doing is as people are running, they're breathing normally. And every once in a while, and we'll tend to start with every fourth breath as just sort of an orientation point where we're working with athletes, they're going to place their bottom lip in front of their teeth. and and then try to inhale. So it makes a noise kind of like, we call it the squeaky teeth portion of the breath. And then in the same inhalation, they're gonna drop their lip out of the way and simultaneously relax. Now, what we see laryngoscopically is that the glottis will actually narrow um, in that squeaky teeth portion of the breath and then pop open on the, what we call the Darth Vader portion of the breath. We have kind of a colloquial way of teaching things. Um, that doesn't happen initially. There's other ways of forming that high resistance phase. So you can put the two lips together. You can actually breathe through the nose if you oppose the tongue to the top of the mouth. And then you can, you can actually put the tongue behind the top teeth. And this especially works well with people that have like orthodontic stuff going on where there's gaps in the teeth. So you can make a breath kind of like and um, which also works well for swimmers or especially butterflies that have their chin forward. So mechanically, there's a number of different things that you can do. But the main disclaimer is that it actually takes us, you know, doing this, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 times a year, three days to teach people. And, and so it's not reasonable to think that you're going to pick this up in 10 minutes and have a great outcome unless you're really lucky, which is actually what happened to us the very first time we tried it. Uh, which is why we stuck with it. But our general experience after that is it takes quite a while. Yeah, yeah. And so would you have success with, is it always when the video, you've got the athlete with the video there to show them or can you teach it without, the, have you had much success without having the? Yeah, well, so this is where the psychology plays into it. So to us, the scope is a tool, right? It's It's a learning tool. And for the right person with the right learning style, especially those that are sort of really exploratory and then just need to see it themselves. And so some, a lot of high performance types, they actually don't really believe anything that I say. They'll smile, they'll sort of be polite, sort of like a teenager or those with sort of mild narcissistic traits. They're, they're not really, really listening. They just wanna get in there and see it and try different things. And 
sort of experiment on their own. And then, and that's sort of our way of building the relationship. And then once we're there, and once there's a little bit of trust, I can build up on that. And so the scope actually serves different purposes that overlap with sort of the behavioral health side of things. And, and I guess the disclaimer with all of that is I'm a pulmonologist, I'm not a psychologist. So like take all of that with a, a huge bucket of salt. But I think I just want to sort of underscore that it's all just about connecting with the person and, and getting a good teaching product out there. The scope might help with that. For some people, it's just a human rights violation and just total discomfort and a total distraction. And then it's a horrible idea. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's it's like you say, it's the educational side of thing is massive, isn't it? And and um, Todd, would you ever use an inspiratory muscle trainer at all with ILO? Um, so th this is like, I'd be curious to see what Dr. Clem thinks on this. I have not had a lot of luck on it. And, and I think what shades us as providers is if you don't hit a lot of early luck with stuff, you tend to give up on it. So I actually do not routinely use it. There's, there's times when I do, but it's, it's actually very few and far between, but I know that's sort of what I understand different than the Norwegian experience. So I'd be curious to see what Dr. Yeah, Clem. What do you say, Clem? Yes, uh, we have used it a lot, actually, uh, but it's really important to, to get um, what you were talking about, uh, Julie, the, the how you breathe and to train that uh, uh, breathing position and to get uh, a movement in the thoracic uh, area uh, and not in the shoulder and upper um, airways. And uh, so, so we are doing now on a big RCT study, which includes uh, um, IMT and also uh, speed therapist and other uh, kind of uh, treatment uh, uh, options. Uh, because it's it, what we are seeing is that in, in some patients, uh, IMT can be really, really helpful, but not in all. And we, we are struggling a little bit to see who it will help and who it uh, doesn't help. But what we are doing now in the study, we always do the laryngoscopy when we are training uh, or teaching the patient to use the IMT. Because we have had several patients coming over to us using the IMT power breathe, and uh, they actually have uh, um, making the obstruction worse because mm. they have done it not correctly. Um, so, so we we feel it's it's really helpful to have the the ringoscope in place uh, when teaching, and so now we have that have um, two physiotherapists uh, doing this uh, laryngoscopy during the IMT teaching. Mm. It, it just highlights the importance of individualizing the therapy, isn't it? Like what works for one person doesn't always work for the next person. I know I, I find that with a lot of my techniques, um, you know, some things just don't work at all. And I know that um, one of the questions was to me talking about measuring heart rate. Uh, with um, athletes and whether I do that routinely um, when it comes to breathing and um, again I'd almost individualize it sometimes you know what it's like when uh, um, you're hanging on to measurements and watching for results and sometimes when you over overly look at things and they get a bit sort of too too um, fascinated with the data then they're sort of losing sight of how they're feeling and relaxing um, but at the same time, I, I'm a massive fan of teaching athletes how to relax and reduce tension. And so this is not while they're exercising and doing their sports, but this is how they're able to get themselves to sleep at night. What they're, uh, you know, what I say to them, how do you relax? And, and they always give me a, oh, I, you know, watch TV and then I'm like, that, that's not relaxing. You know, how do you really relax? And and, and then maybe if I wanted them to really appreciate the physiological benefits of relaxation, you might have a look at the heart rate and how it pulls it down and how slow breathing can really help you to relax more. Um, let's just see if there's any other uh, questions coming in here. Not sure if either of you two got any questions at all for, for the panel. I'm just gonna have a look and see if there's anything else going on. Um, I think 
think we've covered all of them, um, I believe. Oh, no, there was one about speech and language therapy. Uh, you know what? And, and whether I work with a speech and language therapist or use in an ideal world, 100 percent multidisciplinary, you know, uh, and that's something I'm definitely uh, working on at the ISCH. I just feel like we can all contribute. And I know we all overlap quite a lot. But I think that, um, you know, having having uh, multidisciplinary approaches is um, ideal, isn't it? So yes to that. So maybe just for the last few minutes, we could, uh, if there's no more questions coming in. Um, oh, well, hang on a minute. Then we have got one about sort of seasonal changes and what that might have impact on um, our breathing patterns and, uh, you know, with ILO or exercise induced bronchoconstriction. Anyone got any thoughts on that in terms of how we manage that with our athletes? I, I, I'll throw out one idea and then sort of, I'm curious to see what happens um, in the UK and Scandinavia. Um, so I'm in the, the United States and I'm in the middle of the continent. So there's some pretty drastic temperature changes where we'll get changes of like at times, especially in the spring and fall, like 30 degrees centigrade in one day type of thing. Um, and so I, what we're cognizant of doing is just getting the athletes to develop self-awareness around what they're actually dealing with. Because once they can define it, they can respond to it rather than just sort of let the world happen to them. And another thing that happens with us in the Western United States is we really, really struggle with fires every year. And so our air quality index like routinely in the summers are over 100 and there's times where we, when there's fires nearby it's in the 300 to 400 range and you know clearly at that point it's unhealthy to be outside but just having the athletes have a degree of awareness around it is central to then coming up with plans be um you know so rather than coming up with really specific plans on at, during this talk i would just say the first thing is just to be able to identify what's happening mm. Clem, anything else you want to add to that? Um, yes, I think it's important not to forget uh, like upper airways and uh, allergy and the uh, thing can be uh, a mixture of uh, things like Martin Schellner's talked about earlier today. Uh, you have to consider the whole system. Um, but what we have seen in the Norway is that uh, people are complaining more when it's cold and uh, foggy, for example, when it's the mist the weather, uh, but not actually a seasonal thing. No. So not so much allergy, but I think we should not forget it. Mm, definitely. I think, yeah, I think that was what I was, um, my point with that slide around all the different triggers. It's looking at the athlete holistically and looking in, and Todd, you mentioned this, the environment, you know, in terms of what the athlete's in and what might be um, just aggravating, um, you know, to things that might be changing the way we breathe or, or potentially some of the symptoms. OK, so we've got just a couple of minutes left and I really um, would like to finish off with some sort of take home messages, uh, which might be nice just to finish the morning off. So, um, Hege, shall I start with you? Is it, what, what would be your take home message to the delegates? Oh, um... That will be that don't um, don't forget about ALO. It's quite common uh, and it can uh, ruin or impact uh, athletes career or life. Um, it's mostly during inspiration. So if the patient struggle or, or the athlete struggle with inspirational breathing, at least think of ALO and think on the whole um, respiratory system from the nose until the lungs. Lovely, lovely. And Todd? Yeah, um, so just as the pulmonologist thinking of behavioral health, some portion of your decision making comes from that human interaction between the patient and you. And just to be aware of like, what is the patient bringing to the table and what are you bringing to the table that sort of might influence that? Um, and then sort of downstream of that therapeutically, how can you use those things to your advantage? So. How can you better communicate with people? How can you better influence them to, um, you know, to develop a little bit better adherence to your interventions and um, sort of enhance the likelihood that the relationship will continue? Lovely. Wonderful. And I suppose my final message is, is really just to, to look at the athlete as a whole, um, to really not underestimate 
the uh, the power of changing a breathing pattern and, and sort of recognise. I think we just presume that we all breathe OK because it's automatic and it so can go so badly wrong without us even realising. So I suppose it's just just question how you breathe, how your athletes breathe and, you know, potentially are they breathing to the best to get the best performance? Uh, so I just want to conclude this morning's sessions and thank you both so much for, uh, uh, Todd, you're, it's the middle of the night for you, isn't it? So uh, well done. I hope, I hope uh, you know, you're not too shattered today. And um, I look forward to the uh, ILO conference coming up in Norway to, or, uh, in, a, uh, in June, uh, which will be fab. Um, so I highly recommend that. So yeah, thank you very much, guys. Um, have a break now and we look forward to seeing you after lunch uh, for the afternoon session.